Good morning. Glad to see you here. And those of you that are tuning in, God bless you for tuning in. And uh, I hope that you'll listen to this to the very end because this is a very important message. We've been fasting wrong thoughts. We have people around us that are well-meaning, people that raised us up, people that said things to us over the years, got into our head, and then we started repeating those things. And some of those things are not good for you because they actually will envelop your mind, take over and, and kill most of your hope and your faith. Today we're going to talk about that. Don't get your hopes up. How many of you have ever had somebody tell you that? Don't get your hopes up. I'm going to show you today in the Scripture why that is demonic. See, just because something doesn't happen like McDonald's, you know, you go stand in line for a couple of minutes, you fuss because it's a couple of minutes. But God says be patient. Patient endurance wins this race. You know God is not quick to do anything. He's testing our faith to see if we're going to believe Him and stand on those things which He has said to us. I want you to know how much God loves you. He's not angry with you. He doesn't get angry with you because Jesus took all of your sin debt and mine. God is love. By definition, there's no other definition for love. Men have all kinds of thoughts about love, but unless it's love with God in mind, we're not loving like we should. How many of you love people? How many have been let down by people? Now here's what God says to the people that are born again. He says that, you know, I will withhold no good thing from them that love me. Do you love God? Now you have to ask that question. Do I love God? Do I trust Him? He will not withhold any good thing from them that love Him and are called according to His good purpose. Not your purpose in His name. God calls you into existence to be a witness for Him in all of the world. Not just in this box. Not just in your neighborhood but with every person that you come in contact with. Every person needs to know where you stand. That actually offsets those that are not called according to His purpose. But you'd be amazed the amount of people that don't know Christ and they hear about Him and come immediately under conviction because they know they're not living like they should. In the back of their minds, they know that God is going to call them to give an account for their life before Him. One day, they'll all stand before Him. He'll look in their eyeballs and say, What did you do with my son? Did you present the good news that he had paid the sin debt? Did you ever tell people that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus for those who walk in? according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Every time a person gets in the flesh, they're not walking in the Spirit. That means that the Spirit man is not in control of that person at that point. Walking in the Spirit doesn't mean getting religious with people. It means listening to God while you're in the midst of a conversation. Having the discipline to control your tongue and to say only got what God wants you to say to those people. Now, people say, that's just too tough. No, it isn't tough at all. You see, because you and that undisciplined flesh want to live your life on your own terms. But God sent you here for His terms. And I promise you, there's a lot of difference between your terms and His. Amen? Today I'm going to read some scripture before we get into the slideshow, okay? Romans chapter 5, verse 2 through 5 says this, By whom 
also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And rejoice, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Those of you that don't know what I just said, the glory of God is His esteemed presence. When you're walking with Him, He's with you always. He never leaves you. That means you take Him into the darkest areas of your life and need to be very careful about the words you speak. We'll give an account for every idle word. Don't tell somebody, hey, don't get your hopes up. You can't believe how demonic that is when this is what he says we're supposed to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That God is going to be with us always. He's going with us everywhere we go. Our spirits, how many of you feel His presence? People say, well, I don't feel any, anything. If you're beyond feelings, you need to be saved. You need to ask God to come into your heart. Because people that are beyond feeling are not, you know, they haven't been renewed in their faith and know God as He is. It goes on to say, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Oh, I don't want to go through that. It doesn't matter. If God's going with you through that tribulation, then He's going to create patience in you, and patience does something too. And patience, experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now the love comes from the Holy Ghost. When people say, I love you, be careful what you're saying. If you don't understand what that love is, you couldn't love to begin with. Love is of God. Understand that. And a person that loves, loves because the Holy Spirit is in them. But a person that says, I love, and they're in the flesh, that doesn't mean love. That's something else. Usually intent of lust. You know, a desire for something out of somebody and that kind of thing. And we, we put our trust in God to provide for our, how many of our needs? Oh. oh, do you? Let me ask you the truth. Do you stand up and ask God for everything? God, I know you're going to provide everything that I need. Please, God, hear my faith. And I have hope in you alone that these things will come to pass. If you don't have that hope, something's going to happen and you're going to say, well, God's not faithful. He didn't answer my prayer. But see, you don't remember what it says in James about double-minded people. A double-minded man gets what from the Lord? Nothing. It isn't God that is the problem. I promise you 100% of the time the problem rests on, on that flesh of yours that doesn't abide in the Word and that Word abide in you. You have to have that abiding presence of the Word in you. He says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Not going into the world and argue with, with people that don't have a clue about what it is to have a, a relationship with a living God. Our God gives us hope. Without Him, you would be hopeless. I promise you would have no hope at all without God. At the end of the day, if God is not your, your God and Jesus is not your Savior, what kind of hope could you have? If you're living in the world and you're living for the world, you know that in the world, the world is not of God. It's, it's doing its own thing. It's pushing away God and the, and the memory of God and doesn't want God in their life. Listen, when you do that, it's to your harm. It's, it's going to be an eternal harm as well if you don't stop it 
and ask Jesus Christ into your heart. There is no other, no other God. And he says, put no other God before me. We have to know who, we, who we're serving. My relationship gets closer and closer the more I know about him. My trust in him gets greater and greater because I see what he has promised and his promises are precious promises. And those promises, we stand on them. I promise you that God will be faithful to watch over his word and keep it for you. But you, you have to know what he promises. Does he promise to, to give you everything you want and desire out of your lust and your, and your flesh? No, he doesn't. Those things that you have need of, he promised to give you. If you sit around and say, well, he didn't give me what I wanted. Well, look, I want to tell you a little spoiled self that God doesn't have to do that. He gives you what you need. He promised He'd give you all of your needs. Do you know what you need? I'm absolutely sure that you don't. You know, until God says, you need this. You're sitting around telling God what you think you need. How many of you have ever done that to God? Your prayers are filled with telling Him what you want instead of asking. And, you know, there are people that I have dealt with over the years and they'd come to me and ask me to pray that God would do something that is not His will. I've had people that ask me uh, to pray against things that God was for because they didn't want what was going on in their life. Listen to me. God doesn't take instruction. He doesn't have to. God's all wise. You're not. You need the wisdom from the Lord. And He said He doesn't upbraid. He will give you wisdom. If you will come to Him and ask, He would give you more wisdom. You need wisdom, I promise you. Because all the knowledge in the world makes you an idiot until God gives you wisdom. I'm telling you, there are so many people today that have gotten offline because they think that they know everything. That knowing can get you in trouble if you're not asking God to give you the wisdom to use what you know in the way that He wants you to use it. Amen? Listen to me. You can't live for God as many years as I've lived for Him and not know that He's in control. And when you think you're in control, trouble's coming. It's coming. And you know, our, our Heavenly Father knows how to pull a switch out and get you good. And He doesn't do that because He hates you and He's not abusive with it. He's trying to get you in line. We were called sheep. A shepherd takes his goad and gets the sheep going in the right direction. If you keep trying to go against the goad, uh, it's going to hurt. God has a way of getting us in line with Him. Your steps are ordered of the Lord, not of yourself. Does that make sense to anybody? That the things that we do, some, uh, so many of them, don't have anything to do with God. He says in everything to give, you, to give Him thanks. What does everything mean? Just the things that please you? Or everything? And everything. You can't do anything in John 15. You can't do anything without Him. Yes, I can. No, you can't. The moment that He takes breath away from you, I promise you, you will not do a thing. <laughs> you live and move and have your being in Him even if you don't acknowledge it. But our Father in heaven has given us life. He's given us hope. He's given us faith in Christ Jesus. And, he, and, and His Word is good. 
that He has paid your sin debt in full, not in part. If I go to God and I repent of my sin, I'm just obeying Him. Repent means I'm acknowledging the wrong that's in my life and I'm saying I don't want to do that anymore. It's not, I'm sorry, and then go back and do it again. That's not godly sorrow and it doesn't bring around the holiness that God wants to give to you. You know, when a person has a habit of sinning, they continue in sin. But when you break that habit, it is a habit. When you break the habit of sin, then you're walking with Him in holiness. You won't have to worry about, you know, not seeing God. You will see Him in everything. All of us know that God has promised that He's put people around us to help us. Some of them are angels and you can't see them. Sometimes you can. Sometimes He will show you angels. I tell, I tell people, you know, I don't know anybody that has seen as many as I have. To be honest with you, when I show people pictures and things of, uh, that God has done for me, they're astounded. Well, He doesn't do that for me. God is not a respecter of persons. He will do it for anyone that is truly serving Him. He promised He would. Not only that, He'll show up and talk to you. And I want you to know there's nothing that I desire more than that. I, I long for the moments where He's actually talking to me when I sit down with somebody and they're troubled and they're wanting counsel, let me say this to you. God's my counselor and He teaches me how to counsel. I've been a, you know, a psychological major you know, all my life. But I want to tell you, again, unless you know what God says in His Word, you'll misuse all of that and you'll think, well, you've got some sort of a diagnosis. You've got something out of the DSM, you know, and it, and it says this about you. Well, if you start believing that stuff, you'll never change. There is nothing that God can't do for you. Nothing. God wants to make you His own. He wants you to be like His Son. His Son was pleasing to, uh, to His fa Heavenly Father from the day that He was born till the day that he went to Calvary. He rejoiced in faith. He knew his Father. He, he gave praise to his Father everywhere he went. And he didn't, he didn't back down if the people were not smiling, but they were gritting their teeth against him. By the way, the Scripture is full of that. If you've not read the Bible you'll find out there have been people against uh, believers from the beginning. We do have an enemy. But let me give you some hope in that. Our God gave us all power over all the power of the adversary. That means there's nothing the devil can do to you. He, he goes on to say, and he cannot harm you. Now, God's not going to let harm uh, come your way. By the way, the devil in front of you could be a human. <laughs> I got weak amens here. But you know, the devil inhabits bodies, people. And those people are blind to the truth and they're walking in darkness even to this day. And they grind, their, their grind grits with you. I'll use that southern terminology today. They grind grits with you because you think you... Here's the way they look at you. You think you're something. Now, I know I'm something. Do you? The truth is, is that I'm a son of God. You can't get a higher calling than that. And it doesn't come with other titles. I have a lot of hats that I wear. I've got titles that I don't want to wear. To be honest with you, I'd be, uh, uh, you know, 
Call me Brother Ron. If you're a Christian, I'm your brother. If you're not, don't call me Brother Ron. <laughs> Until you give your heart to Jesus Christ because I'm not your brother when you're in sin. Amen. You're not living for God. Amen. There are people in our lives that are not good for us. They're unregenerated in the mind. Their minds are on the flesh. And they, they sit around and they talk flesh 24-7. If you get around them, they can, they can begin to bring you down. How many of you have been around people that brought you down? Now, God didn't say for us to be around people like that. He actually said, come out of the world and be a separate people. Now, people say, well, you know, how are you going to reach the world like that? Well, we go out in the world. That's not what He said. You're, you're going to be in the world, but not of it. Amen? If you sit around with a bunch of worldly people, I promise you, Hey, there's a time coming where you'll find out that you're compromising the truth and your character will be affected and the flaws of that flesh will begin to show up in you. Amen? Amen. It's not that I hate people. I love people, but I don't love what they do. And unless they're in line with Jesus Christ, I'm not supposed to even have anything to do with them. I'm not even supposed to sit down and eat with them. That's His Word on the matter. If I sit down with them and eat, it makes them think they're okay. When God dealt with people in the Scripture, He used the Apostle Paul to, and to tell a church at Corinth a young man was having uh, an affair with his dad's new wife. Perversion like they had not even seen in those days. <laughs> I'm afraid what we have today would, uh, would make that pale in comparison because the world is filled with those people. They're dogs. Can you call them dogs, Brother Ron? God did. I know Enough to know about the dog brain. The dog brain eats when it's hungry. It sleeps when it's sleepy. It, it's amorous and goes around doesn't care who it has relations with. That's a dog. But there's a piece in our, the middle of our brain that says to us that we're supposed to be His. It's the God brain where your conscience is. A conscience is in the man that has allowed the Word of God to renew his mind. But a conscience isn't in the man that doesn't allow the Word of God to, to create the truths that, that say, this is the way, walk ye in it. Amen? Are you all still listening? I'm trying to get to the message. <laughs> Romans... 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope. What did I just say? God is a God of hope. Now the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace in believing. you got to hear these words. In believing. If you're believing, you don't allow doubt to come into you. Faith actually keeps that doubt away. Faith is believing something before we see it. Because we know the person that promised it. If he promised it, he watches over it to perform it. But the timing is something that goes along with that too because a person that is in Christ Jesus has patience to wait for those things that he's promised. I asked the Lord a day or two ago, I said, Heavenly Father, I, I want to be calm about everything today. I want to glorify Your name, be a blessing to all that I come in contact with. Blink, blink, blink. Somebody comes around and the first thing they do is challenge your calmness. <laughs> 
<laughs> and the devil said, well, God didn't answer that prayer for you. Oh yeah, He did. He just gave me the option whether we were going to abide in the peace that He gives or I was going to get disturbed by it. Do you know what? My flesh wanted to get disturbed by it. I have to apologize that, you know, I still have flesh. <laughs> and I have to say to people sometimes that flesh wants to run away, you know. It, it, and I know how the brain works, see. You, you don't have an emotion until you have a thought process, a belief system inside of you. And that belief system needs to be around what God has said. It's not just what you think, it's what you believe that's going to create the, the emotion that you're supposed to express. But sometimes, would you, would you say amen to this? Sometimes people get under your skin. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, my favorite scripture in the whole Bible. It tells me what my God thinks about me, thinks about you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. This is God speaking. Thoughts of peace and not evil. To give you an expected end. I've had doctors, highly educated men, tell me, you won't make it through this surgery. And I said, I will live and not die and I will glorify the Lord with my voice. He said, I'm glad you got that kind of thought process, but I, I've got to tell you, you might not get up off this table. I said, I will see you in the morning. And I saw him the next day. He was late coming in. <laughs> and he came in and said, Good morning, sunshine. I said, Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> looked at my watch to see if it was still morning. <laughs> yeah. uh, Psalm 39, 7 says, And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in Thee. You know, when you want, you know, fellowship with God, you know, continuously, Everything else is a distraction. My hope is that He will give me a time to sit down, express my heart with Him, my praise to Him. You know, as Jimmy Evans says, you don't get in here, this is the Holy of Holies, if you don't come with praise. <laughs> Listen, you could learn something from that. If you want to get into the heart of the person, you come with praise. Thanksgiving. You know, that's wonderful. That's a, that's a great shirt. That's, you, know, you look so good. That's not flattery. That's praise. And the person will open up to you. You want to get in the heart and know what's going on in the heart? That's the way you're in. Amen? Start off with all the other stuff and the me-ism. Listen, most of your conversation is not about the people around you. And if you want to be a, a person that people like, you've got to get the me out of your, your words and start talking about them. What that does is attract but when you start talking about all the things that me, 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 get your, 
gaze off your belly button and start looking at the people around you. Build each other up in the Lord. Is that what He commanded us to do? You can't do that while you're talking about me, 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 me all the time. That turns people off. Amen? Amen. Well, I know what your me is. I've heard it a hundred times. Start looking for the good in one another. Start praising people for the, uh, the good that's in them. And that good, can you recognize this and stop getting your eyes on the flesh? The good that's in a man or a woman or a child is God. And praise is demanded of God. When you see good, you know He's there. And you ought to be building it up in each other. Amen? Are y'all listening? Deuteronomy says, Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord God, He it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Do you believe the Word of God? He'll go with you. Even into trouble, He'll go with you. All those people are against you, round about as David would say. And then you look up to the Lord and and you say, I know you will keep me. You know, I don't have to look at, the, I mean, hard faces, for heaven's sake. I've seen thousands of them over the years. They look at you and get cockeyed when you don't say something they like. I tell people that come in and they have a, an unequal yoke relationship. Listen to me. They want me to tell them something other than what God said. They want me to say it's okay to divorce. God gives very few reasons for a divorce. But I had them come in and then I, I said, can you hear the truth? Now, I'm, I'm telling you, truth is not going to meet you uh, in the middle. Truth is going to hit you down in the bones. It's going to separate. It's going to cause you to have to lose some of those ideas you have. Well, they're so, they're so evil. They're so mean. Well, you married them and you're part of the problem. They say something, you say something back in like manner. That's not God. If you had started off looking at them, loving them, and that's how most of you got married. You had to get off of your, your navel and start looking at them and talking about them. And that was attracting them. And then after they got, got the person, you know, I got them. Oh my, what did I get? They start complaining. Well, you start complaining and tearing down people. From the very beginning, you know that this is not going the way that you're going to build a relationship. And you're not going to be happy because what you're doing is against loving and against the relationship. I see people that can't even look at each other in relationships. If they do, then they're you know, giving a face to each other. I've had people come in my office and sit there an hour and scream at each other, and then I'd say, your time's up now. <laughs> well, we didn't get to talk. I said, you didn't give me a chance to talk. You wanted to scream and fuss, and by the way, Get your checkbook out because I had to listen to it for an hour. <laughs> when you're ready to talk again, come on back. <laughs> there are things that we have to understand. God says when you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, 
you've done it unto me. Relationships are a big thing with God. He loves it when brethren can be together in peace. When they can build each other up. Encourage each other. Spark the hope that they need to come continue to combat the evil that is around them. I'm not afraid of anything. To be honest with you, there's not a thing that I'm afraid of. I've had threats over the years. People <laughs> pulling one one guy pulled a forty five and put it at my temple if I wouldn't tell his wife to do what he said. I said, I know where I'm going. Do you? <laughs> Give me that gun. I put it in my desk drawer. I still have it. <laughs> he got killed two weeks later. He was out dealing drugs and the drug deal went sideways and the guy shot him with his gun right between the eyes. He was gone. I felt... Sorry, and at the same time, happy. <laughs> the wife was not going to have to deal with that anymore. His children had a chance to grow up in an environment that didn't en encourage that kind of behavior. Amen? Amen? It takes more than just... Bumping uglies, I'll put it that way. To make you a mother or a father. You're not a mother and father until you've got God in your heart. Amen. You're just a bad demonic influence until you do. Amen. So, but anyway, Deuteronomy 31.6 says, Be strong and of good courage. Fear not nor be afraid of them, for uh, the Lord thy God, He it is that doth go with thee, He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Psalm 39 and 7, And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. When you know where your hope is, yeah, the treasure's there, the promises are there, and he doesn't move. You know, we, we're running all over the place. Where are you, God? <laughs> Why don't you sit down and take some time with me and you'll find out where I am. So, his relationship to us is something that will make our hope sight. You hope. You have faith. And then He makes the thing you're hoping for sight. Once you get to the place that you want God and you want to sit down with Him because He changes who you are every time you sit down with Him and have those conversations around His Word, His promises, He changes you because the glory of God is there on His Word in the presence of somebody that gives Him praise. And then, listen, you have to come into His courts with praise, His gates with thanksgiving. You're not getting in until you do. That's the ticket in. He's trying to teach you how to deal with one another. Praise. Thanks ungratefulness, no thanksgiving. It's satanic. We live in an entitled generation. This generation thinks, you know, you owe this to me. I, who told you that? I have missionaries always asking me, you know, Bishop, can you send me money? I don't know you. First of all, I don't know you. Tell me something about yourself. Because there's no hope of that until you actually let me in. 
and know something about you. Not that I have all the money that the, I mean, for heaven's sake, I have thousands of those inquiries and then when I don't give it to them, then they unfriend me or whatever it is on social media. Well, that told me what I needed to know. They think that ministry is about making you rich because they look at these jokers out here on television that have these big churches and entertainment centers and that kind of thing. But those, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I came out of a big church and you don't know that many people. You can shake hands with them and forget who they were and it's embarrassing when you say, is this your first time? And they say, I've been here for five years. <coughs> you can't pastor, you know, 27,000 people. I'm just going to... And we were not called to entertain people. We were called to bring the truth of Jesus Christ to the world. Amen? And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to get on to people about having big places, but I'll tell you, most of these people are trying to please the flesh. They're not trying to bring people to righteousness. They're telling them, you're okay. God approves of you. Now that's not exactly what the Word God says. Jesus paid your sin debt, but He requires your obedience. He gave a life for you. Now He's expecting you to give your life for Him. And people that are, oh, I've, I've been there. You know, you got every kind of thing going on in the, in the pews. Every sin imaginable is going on in those pews. And every one of them that come to those places are wanting somebody to make them feel better about themselves because they know they're not in good standing with God. They want somebody to tell them they're in good standing with God. When you repent of your sin, that old man will die. You won't continue in the flesh. Do you understand what I'm saying? That man must die. That's what baptism is about, isn't it? If you believe in Jesus Christ that He was raised from the dead, our Lord knows whether you really believe. And you're baptized, that means I'm putting to death my old man. It's symbolic in the beginning. But I promise you, He's taking that, you know, He's saying, I know you don't know what you're doing. But when you lay down there, that old man has got to die. And that new man is going to come up. You're not getting away with what you've been doing. Your life must change now, and you must serve your God. Not yourself. Y'all are missing a lot of amen spots. I know I'm not going to get to this. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's all right, Lord. <laughs> I do want to take you to a place though and, and read you some scripture. Hebrews eleven, starting in verse one, and I'm reading this from the message in the Peterson um, uh, version of the Bible. Look him up. I don't have time to tell you about him, but you know, he's passed away. He was a great theologian. But he put this in terms that you'll understand because most of us don't speak King James English, do we? Verse 1, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is a firm foundation understanding everything that makes life worth living. What does that? Faith. 
It is our handle on what we can't see. <laughs> the act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. Listen to this. By faith we see that the world call, uh, uh, that the world called into existence by God's word, what we see created was created by what we don't see. By an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God than Cain. It was what he believed, not what he brought, that made the difference. God knew the heart of the man that brought the gift. How many have ever given a gift and it wasn't with the heart of God behind it? See, <laughs> We could read that the man that sits you down at a table and does, he he doesn't have a heart for feeding you, but he says, "Sit down and eat." It's in Proverbs. Go read it. <clears throat> That's what God noticed and approved of as righteousness. After all these centuries, that belief continues to catch our notice. By an act of faith, Enoch skipped death. Did you know faith can cause you to skip death? When you put God in your constant thoughts, memory, the things that He's always done, thanking Him all the time for what He's already done for you and thanking Him for the things He's going to do for you and thanking Him for being in you so you can do things for Him. Amen? Amen. They looked all over and couldn't find him because God had taken him. Can you imagine that? Being so close to God. God said, hey, you, you this close, come on. <laughs> Didn't die. The other one was Elijah. He got in a fiery chariot and flew away. He dropped his mantle on a boy child that would become a prophet that did twice the amount of miracles that Elijah did. Amen? Amen. You can't go on and on through the faith chapter without seeing that the people that actually do meaningful things have a firm foundation and belief in Christ Jesus. These people know that their God keeps His promises. They know that He does miracles for them. He goes with them into the problem areas. He, he keeps them secure and safe. We had people the other day, we had, you know we had a little twister that went through West Macon and came back. I mean, can't go down the road without seeing twisted signs. Do you know that when you speak to the Lord, He's the Lord of the storm, and so you say, Father, take that thing back to where it came from. It, it, don't, it won't come nigh you. It will not come nigh you. Isn't that what He said? A thousand over here, ten thousand over there, but not to you. There's a, there's a separation in those that belong to Him. And when we speak to Him, He keeps His promises. I think my grandson remembered when I spoke to him and I saw two tornadoes coming at us. And I should have said, take that thing back to where it came. But I said, send it back to where it came from. Oh Lord, it went back into the West and tore up a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I should have said, for their sake, take, you know, let the heavens take that thing up. And sometimes, you know, you get in a hurry, and you're looking at it, and you got somebody there, and they're worried, and but your hope is supposed to be the same at all times. Your hope is in God. It's not in, you know, 
something spectacular happening all the time, but I want to tell you, when you need it, He's there. You know, if I ride one of them out of here, it won't be to be beat up and that kind of, and I'll be doing it like Enoch. <laughs> Amen. I, I hope you've been listening. Romans 8.24 says, For we are saved by hope. So when somebody says, don't get your hopes up, they're telling you, take your eyes off God because, you know, He ain't going to hear you anyway. He's not going to do this for you. They have so much doubt and unbelief. And God did not build unbelief up. He condemned unbelief. And He told people that they needed to believe. He even told the ones that were His children, O oh, you of little faith. Because they were getting their eyes on the storm, not on Him. Peter, can I come to you? Yeah. And he got his eyes on the waves. Where did he go? Jesus had to pull him out of the waves. We have a God that is there. He's faithful. He knows we're going to fail. But if our, if our hope remains in Him and our faith is sure, then we can find that the Lord is what He said. That He is always going to be a God. He's already told us in Jeremiah what we can expect of Him. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, God said. Not to destroy you. He knows you're going to make a mess. <laughs> what child doesn't when they're growing up? All you parents and grandparents know that, don't you? Children make a mess. And they're all about themselves. What are you going to do for me? What am I going to do for God? Can I do anything for God? What does He need? Here's what He needs. He needs somebody to love Him and learn His love so they can love others. He needs somebody that says to a person that is entangled in the world and in the flesh, there is hope in Jesus Christ that you can change, that you'll be a different person at the end of the day. I want to say to you at the end of this message, our hope is in God alone. We sang a song, all other hope is sinking sand. All, over, all other relationships other than God are going to fail us. Even ourself, I will not... He, Trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. That means you can be sweet, but if I put my trust in you, you're going to let me down at some point. God said, I'm not going to let you down. I'm going to be with you till the end of the age. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Do you have that God in your heart? If not, let me say how simple it is. If you'll say, Father, I need a Savior. I invite that Savior into my heart right now. I ask you for your Holy Spirit because without your Holy Spirit, I can't be yours. But with the Holy Spirit, I could be made a son or daughter of God. I don't need a lot of titles. I don't need a lot of fanfare. I need you, God. Come and dwell in me and teach me your ways. Show me what you have planned for me. Direct my steps and order them on a daily basis and help me to have love so I can demonstrate it to others. 
I ask that in Jesus' name. Now, if you just prayed that prayer, you belong to the Lord Jesus because He hears that prayer. He'll hear every sinner's prayer. But you have to continue to pray to Him. Continue to trust Him. Continue to learn of Him. And He'll be a holy Father to you. As He said to me in the death of my father, He said, I will be a father to the fatherless. That was a long time ago. And by the way, the older I get, that only is a perception of people around me. <laughs> Inside, I'm still young. And God looks at me like, you still wet behind the ears. Listen to me some more. <laughs> All you know came from me. That's an amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your patience. God bless you all. Amen.